Good morning. The first reading this morning is from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligations to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearless, fearful slaves. Instead, you have received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. The second passage is from Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 8. It was the year of King Uzziah. Sorry, it was the year that the king Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, It's all over. I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of Heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? I said, Here I am. Send me. Good morning, everyone. As you could uh, see, our, our theme song for the youth retreat was It Might Get Loud. And it did get a little loud, uh, and I lost my voice. So excuse my little raspiness this morning. <clears throat> Two weeks ago, we celebrated the ascension of Jesus. And last week, we celebrated Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And today is called Trinity Sunday. And on Trinity Sunday, we can celebrate that each of the Godhead has come to earth to reveal themselves to mankind. So when we read in the Old Testament, it's the time of the Father. It was represented by things happening in biblical proportions. Sin entered the world. A flood covered the world. A nation of Israel was born to represent God to the world. And God revealed himself in pillars of fire, in earthquakes, pillars of flood, um, pillars of cloud. And his provision came also in biblical proportions, right? It came in, in manna on the, in the desert. It was on a massive scale. And it was representative of the God of angel armies, who is big enough to create and to destroy. And then we read in the Gospels, the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it was the time of the Son, Jesus. It was represented by God in human flesh. Jesus was introduced as Emmanuel, God with us. His provision came in the compassion of God. Many times in the New Testament, it is recorded that Jesus moved by compassion healed infirmities, forgave sin, multiplied food, taught the crowd, expelled demons. God revealed himself as being one of us, walking alongside us, and being tempted in every way as we are. And things happened on a personal scale. Jesus wept, laughed, ate together. And his ultimate provision came in Jesus' self-sacrifice on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. 
And then we move on to the book of Acts, which is the time of the Holy Spirit. And this is the same time in which we are living now. And it is represented by God making his home in the hearts of mankind. God has gone from speaking from the heavens to walking beside us to now dwelling within us. And his provision comes in new birth, in new baptism, and God's presence within us as the comforter. And things happen on an intimate scale, and change starts in the heart of mankind. And so since the first Pentecost, we have been living in the time of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was prophesied way back in Ezekiel. It said, hear the word of the sovereign Lord. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you. Many refer to this time, the time we're living in now, as the last days. Right? As, as God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit have come to reveal themselves to mankind and to incline our hearts back towards God. And although the word isn't used in the Bible, the word Trinity is what we use to describe our God. Three in one. And this concept is grand. And it is beyond our comprehension. And so there are so many different human analogies that we use to describe Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You might have heard some of these used. A three-legged stool, ice, water, steam, all elements of the same product. Mind, soul, and body. Or a root, uh, a tree with roots, branches, leaves. Each one distinct, but impossible for one to exist without the other. Or an egg, right? Shell, yolk, white. But each of these analogies is not sufficient to describe God because we're using created objects to describe a creator. And we're using finite things to describe an infinite being. And so if at the end of this morning you still feel like you don't understand the workings between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, if you still don't understand how three beings can be separate, but one will take out, because this is good. We are created. He is creator. And Jesus told us in John 3, 8, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so You can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. We cannot explain, rationalize, or confine our God to our human analogies. How small would our God be if we could grasp the infinite? So I think it is a comfort that some of these things are outside our understanding. Because we are mortal beings inside the constraints of time. And if we could understand and truly grasp the length and breadth of our immortal God, he would no longer be immortal, the only wise God. But mostly be comforted if you still don't understand. Because God's goal is not that we would understand and mentally grasp him, but that we would be able to know, trust, and love him. That's the point of my sermon this morning. God's goal is not that we would be able to understand and mentally grasp him, but that we would be able to know him, trust him, and love him. Ephesians 3 says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all God's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. This love, this God who is love, our goal is to know this love, right? Not to mentally understand, because this love surpasses understanding. So we pray that we may know this love that surpasses understanding through the Father, through the Son, and through the Holy Spirit. Two weeks ago, when I was speaking, 
For those of you who are here, we wrote a psalm as we celebrated the ascension of Jesus. And a few of you text me your psalms after service, and thank you. They were lovely to read. One of the youth in our church, Carson, he wrote his psalm as a conversation with God during his time, and he sent it to me. And I have his permission, and I'd like to share with you just a few lines of what he wrote. Wow, he is going up. I said, where is he going? And God said, to heaven. I said, what does it look like up there? And he said, it's a place of peace and wonder. Wonder. Isn't that an unusual word for a child to use? Isn't that beautiful? A place of peace and wonder. God, the Holy Spirit, dwelling within us, setting us up for a talk two weeks later that heaven is a place of wonder. Wondering at the immensity, the complexity, the endless love. Today, wondering how from immense light comes love. Wondering how we can exist in heaven without time, space, gravity, a place of wonder. Not a place of intellect, of understanding, but a place of wonder. Do you remember when you were a child and you were filled with wonder? The smallest things filled us with wonder, and we would stare at a butterfly fly. And do you know what makes us lose our sense of wonder? Knowledge. Knowledge. Decades ago, humanity would wonder at the flight of a bird, imagining the ability to soar through the sky. And then along came the Wright brothers, who created flight. And now very few people are filled with wonder as we board an airplane. We are only concerned if we got that window or aisle seat that we requested, if our flight delay is going to be made up en route, and if we are going to get a meal at all, and will it be palatable? Knowledge has caused us to lose our sense of wonder. Wonder is a feeling of surprise mingled with adoration, caused by something beautiful, unexpected, unfamiliar, or just inexplicable. Inexplicable. This is what Jesus said, surpasses knowledge. It's inexplicable. God is love. We can wonder at this, but we can never fully understand it. So may our knowledge never cause us to lose our sense of wonder. May we realize that the more we know about our infinite God, the more we have to learn. May we be in wonder throughout eternity at the magnificence of our creator God. So today on Trinity Sunday, as we ponder our wondrous God, don't feel bad if you don't understand. That's the point. Be comforted. Don't allow lack of understanding to be lack of belief. Because Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Our faith is not a work of intellect, although intellect is not checked at the door. But I am not here to prove things to you today. I am here to restore your sense of wonder that the almighty God who created the universe and holds it together because of his great love for us came to earth to take on your and my sins so that we can be restored to a relationship with him. I am here to restore your sense of wonder that the God of the universe has also decided by his Holy Spirit to dwell in the hearts of mankind, to any who invite him in. That the God who holds the world in his hand also knocks on the door of our hearts and awaits invitation. That the God who threw the stars into space wants to dwell in your heart. So today on Trinity Sunday, let's look through the eyes of wonder at scriptures highlighting our great God 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's increase our sense of wonder. So firstly, a scripture about God the Father. The verse from Isaiah read by Suzanne is one of my favorites to wonder about. It was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on his lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, two they covered their feet, and two they flew. And they were calling out to each other, Holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. And I said, I am, it's all over. I am doomed. I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips. And I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. This passage talks about God on his throne. The thing that I have such wonder about is the line where it says, the train of his robe filled the temple. Hmm, what does that look like? Because when I think of this verse, I think of a wedding gown. We know on a wedding gown, uh, the, the train establishes prestige, right? It brings glory to the wearer. Did any of you have a train on your wedding gowns? Come on. Yeah, yeah, there we go. We don't wear a train at other times because we don't have attendants to carry it around for us like we do on our wedding day. Does anyone remember Princess Diana's train and how long it was? 25 feet long. 25 feet long. But God, the train of his robe, in biblical proportion, fills the temple. This describes the glory of God. It fills the room. It makes me wonder. It helps restore my sense of wonder. What does this look like? It's inexplicable. Our response to seeing God the Father would also be like Isaiah's. Woe is me. I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. I wonder, but I can never fully grasp the glory of God the Father. And now let's look at Jesus. Philippians 2. Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, the criminal's death. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May your sense of wonder be increased that Jesus, who being in very nature God, came in humility and compassion. He ate with us, cried with us, and he died in our place for the deep love for us. I wonder at such great love and empathy, and I wonder how God is love. I wonder at how the closer I get to Jesus, the more I too can have the attitude of Jesus and take the nature of a servant. The closer I am to Jesus, the more I put to death the attitude of sinful man, of pride and selfishness. And what comes to life is humility, compassion, and a deep love for others. So may we always be in wonder how our attitude can be the same as Christ Jesus, and how many throughout the generations have willingly suffered and even been martyred for the glory of his name. Let's wonder. Lastly, we look at the scripture of the Holy Spirit, which was read to us this morning in Romans 8. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. 
For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led of the Spirit are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you have received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. This is a verse about Holy Spirit, and it makes me wonder. But I also know that I know that I know that God is real. It doesn't make me doubt. It makes me wonder. Even when someone asks me a question about God and I don't know the answer, or I don't know how to formulate a perfect reply, I know God is real because verse 16, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. I don't understand it, but I know it. God's Holy Spirit lives in me, an unholy vessel. He allows me to act contrary to my sinful nature and to put others first. Holy Spirit allows me to have great love for the unlovely. Holy Spirit allows me to give financially to the benefit of others and his kingdom rather than spending it on my own fleeting pleasures. It is God's Spirit inside me who reminds me that if he was small enough for my brain to fully understand, he wouldn't be big enough to save me. And boy, do I need saving. It's through the Holy Spirit in me that I am adopted into his family and I am comforted to call him Abba, Father, Jesus, Savior, Holy Spirit, Comforter, Encourager, Wisdom. For his spirit joins with my spirit and affirms that I am a child of God. Our God isn't one that you understand. Because God's goal is not that we would be able to understand and mentally grasp him but that we would be able to know, trust, and love him. So I encourage you today in this moment of wonder at the glory and the majesty of our great God to do what Isaiah did and to drop to our knees and say, I am a sinful person. I have filthy lips, and I live among people with filthy lips. And to respond by accepting Jesus' death on the cross as forgiveness for all our sins, past, present, and future. For guilt to be removed and to receive freedom from bondage. And then, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in response, to give everything we have to God. Everything we have is a mess, and God does not want us to get cleaned up and then come to him. He is the only one that can remedy whatever problem we are facing. So here I am, Lord. Use me. Send me. Heal me. Deliver me. As we sing this last song, I would like you to give it all to him. You are not designed to carry it all on your own. We are on co-mission with Christ and with each other. So as this last song plays... I invite you to come and receive prayer. There's a prayer circle over there. There'll be some elders, Gavin and myself, standing around during this song. So come to us and approach one of the elders who are at the side. But don't leave today without receiving God's power through the laying on of hands. We have some oil and you can be anointed. Ask for prayer to restore your sense of wonder. Ask for prayer for healing. We can't explain how prayer works, but we can stand in wonder that it does. And that God has instructed us to do this, to do it this way through the body of Christ, for each other to join together. So let's be obedient. And today... If you are here and you are already in awe and wonder at our great God, then I invite you to stand and declare with a loud voice in this song what we believe. 
Not what we understand and can explain, but what we know to be true through God's Spirit confirming it with our spirit. Please join us and stand.